we are in the Crown Chamber of Salisbury Hall, the home of Mr. and Mrs. Walter Goldsmith. We are waiting for a ghost to appear. The ghost of Nell Gwynn. one of the smallest of the stately homes of England. Its approach is by an undistinguished looking farm track leading off the main London road four miles south of St Albans. A sudden switch to the left and you are facing a small bridge over a moat. Cross that bridge and you are on a few square yards of earth whose history is the history of England. For ever since men knew how to build, there has been a house at Salisbury Hall. Beneath this floor is hard-beaten earth, which knew the heavy imprint of a Roman soldier's sandal. But for the legend of Salisbury Hall, and the hauntings, we have only to go back three centuries to those magnificent days of Charles II, that charming, sensual, merry monarch of the Restoration. In 1668, Samuel Pepys wrote in his diary, the king did send for Nell Gwynne. She was 18, a red-headed, impish, witty, loyal gutter snipe who had made her way up from the streets to be an orange seller, to be eventually the best-loved actress and comedian of her day. He was a splendid man in his early 40s. Neither were exactly new to love. The king's mistresses were notorious and legion, and Nellie, well, Nellie came from the poorest streets of London, where life was lived to its fullest, and pleasure taken when and where one might. The liaison that began that day in 1668 was to last until their death. It was here that he brought her away from the prying eyes and gossiping tongues of the court. In that room upstairs, their first son was born, and the king created him Duke of St. Albans. Because from this bedroom window can be seen in the distance the ancient city of St. Albans. Nellie was only 35 when the king died. She outlived him by just two years. Every hour of them in danger of being thrown into a debtor's prison. Her death was in the utmost poverty. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Yes, this is Nellie's house, where she loved and laughed, and to which she now returns. She now returns. She now returns. Have you ever seen a Nell Gwynne, Mr. Goldsmith? No, I regret very much I haven't actually seen Nell Gwynne. But there's a great deal of compelling evidence to show that she does, in fact, reappear. 
That book, by your left hand, Mr. Davis, contains the testimony of no less a person than Sir Winston Churchill's stepfather, who once lived in this house. It's called Edwardian Heydays. Now, ah, here's the passage. One evening at Salisbury Hall, just as it was getting dusk, I came down the staircase, which leads into the old panelled room that we used as a dining room, and there, standing in a corner, I saw the figure of a youngish and beautiful woman with a blue fichu round her shoulders. She looked intently at me, then turned and disappeared through a door in the passage. I followed her and found nothing. She looked so exactly like a former nursemaid of ours called Ellen Bryan that I felt certain she must have died. And I had witnessed an apparition of her at the moment of her death. I thought no more about the matter until a few weeks later when my sister Daisy came to visit us. As Salisbury Hall had been inhabited by Nell Gwynne, I had a hobby of collecting prints of this lady and taking up one, Daisy said, I never realized before the truth of what people used to say about Ellen Bryan, how she was exactly like the pictures of Nell Gwynne. She is here. She is very definitely here. Is she here? I mean, is she in our midst? Oh, yes, without a doubt. But she's fading. I don't think she'll come to this house much longer. Because she appears to me as though she's finally reaching her state of rest. Pity it isn't happening to the one upstairs, Tom. You know, we've got two ghosts at Salisbury Hall. But you have got the ghost of a man here. You pass out of this life, I would say, through rather tragic circumstances. We know all about this one. I'd better give you a bit of the background history first. During the Civil War, this was a royalist stronghold, and the whole house was honeycombed with secret hiding places and so on for hiding arms. And during some engagement in the district, some cavalier fled here and hid in one of these numerous hiding places, and he was awfully afraid he was going to give away secrets. So he committed suicide. Now, Mrs. Goldsmith has had distinct manifestations of this person. Yes, it happened to me in that bedroom through there. One night when I had a rather heavy cold and I went to sleep in that room, I was awakened at about well, one o'clock in the morning, I suppose, by the sound of footsteps passing the door in the corridor outside. I switched on my bed lamp and I expected him to come and see how I was. But the footsteps never returned. In the morning, I asked Walter about this, and he said that throughout the whole night, he'd never stirred. And I've had the same experience several times since then. And to prove that it's not simply my imagination playing tricks on me, I'd like to read you a bit of a letter which I had from Mrs. Rose Stupsall, who spent her childhood in this house. One ghost, often felt by the children, was in the bedroom over the entrance hall with the porch dressing room. This was my parents' room, and a child used to sleep at the foot of the bed. Both my brother and my sister were wakened by something terrifying standing by the bed, and this on many occasions. In the same room, my governess spent a night while my mother was away on business. She said something terrifying came through the door and stood by her bed. Another friend had the same experience. This seems the most convincing evidence of an unseen visitor. Indeed it does. Let me ask you a question, Mrs. Goldsmith. He wants us to follow him. Surely there must have been another wing to this house. Yes, it was burnt down in 1813. But this is where the ghost walks. So you see, Mrs. Goldsmith, you may well have been right about the footsteps that went in one direction only. But you're wrong in thinking, Mr. Goldsmith, that you have just two ghosts. On the way in, I found a third one on the bridge leading to the house. More than two. One thing I will say about these grounds, 
You can hardly dig a spade into the earth without coming up with some archaeological treasure. I found a complete history of artifacts, Roman coins, 15th century spurs. The only thing I haven't discovered is the entrance to the old cellar. This is another of the ghosts of Salisbury Hall. The prototype of the gallant little mosquito fighter bomber which started its life here when the hall became a workshop for Sir Geoffrey de Havilland. Yes, there's no doubt at all but you have the ghost of a woman here. I would have said that she's extremely pleasant and, and uh, if you can describe the word warm-hearted ghost, I'm sure that in life she was. As Tom identified still another ghost, I turned for a last look at this historic and haunted house. My feelings were mixed, as they must ever be when seeking to converse with the world of the spirit. Salisbury Hall had seemed to me aglow with the past. One had felt the presence of Nell Gwynne. I resented the thought that her generous and courageous spirit should ever be in any way earthbound. Perhaps, though, she had been seeking again the happiness that was hers for a short while in this house. They say her image is fading. May we believe, as Tom does, that she is finding her rest and fulfillment in that other life that we hope awaits us all. With joy we leave thee, false world, and do forgive all thy false treachery, for now we'll happy live, that thus we happy live.